Welcome to the big issue selected for the second round in UH Kirling's President's Speaker Series, Health. The inspiration to create this ongoing exploration of important issues facing higher ed was the realization that faculty at the University of Houston Clear Lake, with the support of staff, has always taken the lead when it comes to applying learning for real world solutions. UH Clear Lake has been able to do this because historically, we embrace the challenge of answering the big questions. With today's focus on health, the big question asked in this session is, public health access and pandemics, how can higher education help? We will explore the status of COVID-19, its impacts on higher education, and how higher education can help create a more resilient community and improve the public's health. As always, the issues we address are at the heart of who we are as a regional public institution, committed to our role as a steward of our region. This commitment supports our mission, which reads in part, UH Clear Lake fosters critical thinking and lifelong learning through a strong legacy of vibrant community partnerships complementing its historical focus on teaching, research, creativity, and service. In our pursuit of answering the big questions facing our society, we have sought the thinking, counsel, and advice of acknowledged thought leaders and experts. Today is no exception. Thank you for joining us. Good morning and welcome to the University of Houston Clear Lakes Presidential Speaker Series, The Big Questions. My name is Dr. Kevin Wooten, and I am the Chief Strategy Officer here at the University of Houston Clear Lake, and I am delighted to uh, be a host for this particular event, along with my co-host, Dr. Femi Adati. So let's begin to think a little bit about what we're going to experience today. For our first hour, we are very honored to have Dr. Peter Hotez uh, of Baylor Medical College here in, in Houston, uh, who will present his thoughts around a variety of areas, in specific, the current status of COVID-19, uh, also with respect to, and what I'm really interested in, the lessons that we have all learned from this pandemic. And uh, also, uh, Dr. Hotez, I, I'm, we're going to ask to perhaps extrapolate a bit for the rest of this year and through 2022. And then finally, um, hopefully, let's have a great discussion uh, about the uh, implications for higher education, specifically what can we do to help uh, embolden the um, uh, resilience of, of public health for all of our communities. So this will be followed by a question and answer series and, and a session. And I would like to uh, suggest that, uh, that we have a, a really wonderful faculty uh, panel here today to, uh, to work with us on addressing a number of these issues. So let's, let's get started. It is my very great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Femi Adayedi, and uh, she is a professor of healthcare administration. Uh, she teaches uh, healthcare uh, economics and healthcare policy. And I might also mention that uh, she, is a, um, she, is, she is indeed a, um, a Fulbright scholar, so in the area of healthcare. So I'd like to ask Dr. Adaidi to go ahead and now introduce uh, our distinguished guests, please. Dr. Adaidi. Good morning. I thought I was going to be muted. <laughs> I had to mute, unmute myself. We're very honored this morning to have Dr. Hotez in our midst. He needs no formal introduction, but please allow me to say a few words to introduce him. Dr. Hotez is a professor of pediatrics and molecular virology at Baylor College of Medicine, where he's also the Dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine. He's the co-director of the Texas Children's Center for Vaccine Development and the endowed chair in tropical pediatrics. Notably, Dr. Hotez has co-authored more than 550 scientific articles, and he appears frequently on major news outlets promoting global health and vaccinations. Please join me in warmly welcoming Dr. Hotez to UHCL and to the President's Speaker Series. Dr. Hotez, you have the floor. 
Oh, thank you very much, Dr. Yadi. It's uh, an honor to be here and uh, appreciate the opportunity uh, to speak to uh, UH Clear Lake. And uh, I hope in the future that I can give another lecture in person uh, post-apocalypse, which I, I think may not, may not be too long. Uh, so there's an article coming out in the Houston Chronicle, which on Sunday, which I make the statement, I think we are going to <coughs> resume something towards normalcy, at least in the United States. But we have a lot of issues to fix before we get there. And what I'm going to do is maybe talk for 30 minutes and then leave, leave a lot of time for questions uh, if we can. Because because uh, I'll be saying a number of provocative things and uh, be curious to hear your feedback on, on everything. So this will be kind of a mixture of science and science policy and global health and bringing to bear other, uh, <coughs> excuse me, other aspects um, that we don't ordinarily think about purely in, in the scientific realm. First, let's talk briefly about um, what's happening with, with COVID-19. Um, I know everyone's exhausted, but unfortunately we have now to contend with this new variant, the B117 variant coming out of the United Kingdom. And it's far more aggressive than anything we've seen before. It's more contagious, more transmissible, higher morbidity and mortality, and um, younger people are getting sick. And uh, that that's a huge problem. So we're, um, you know, it's gonna be a matter of whether we can fully vaccinate the American people in time in order to get ahead of this variant. So wherever you see the B117 variant dominate, the cases really start to go up. So we've, we're seeing that right now in Michigan, we're seeing it in Minnesota, we're seeing it in the Northeast. Now it's going up in Florida and it's always preceded by about, when about 70% of the virus isolates are the B117 variant and it starts to go up. And guess where Texas is right now? Texas is flat in terms of new cases, but now we're hitting that 70% mark. So. And, you know, maybe it, Texas is different from other states, but if it behaves like the other states, we're going to start to see the cases going up. And, and that gives me uh, a lot of pause for concern. Again, it's younger groups that are, are getting sick. So it's, we have to now uh, give special attention to younger groups getting vaccinated. And now the, the state has made that commitment to get every uh, adult vaccinated uh, without, without restrictions. Um, just for the scientists in the group and the chemists, uh, I thought I'd say a couple of words about why this B117 variant does what it does. Um, one of the interesting, the major mutation that the B117 variant has is in the spike protein, where there's a shift from an asparagine to a tyrosine. And so there's a switch to an aromatic amino acid, which now has these new ring ring interactions and extra hydrogen bonds with um, the receptor. So that little simple change in chemistry is what's causing all of the havoc right now in terms of the uptick in the upper Midwest and the Northeast. And, and I think that's, that's something that uh, is a you know, challenge. And I'll try to highlight challenges number one for UHCL as I go along. One is, you know, we don't really think of uh, major policy decisions as related to an amino acid substitution and a hydrogen bond. And it just goes to show you how all disciplines really interface uh, with uh, COVID-19 in a place like, you, you, you know, UHCL, I think is in a good position to really uh, look at some of those things. Let me just zoom out a little bit with this picture and show you the spike protein. Um, uh, this is what it looks like. It's these little pink flowers over here in this full color imaging. That's a, trim that's a trimer. Those are three polypeptides intertwined. And here's a blow up of that. And each of them have a this receptor binding domain that binds with the receptor, which is the angiotensin converting enzyme receptor. So the receptor itself is an enzyme in our vascular tissues and cardiovascular tissues and adipose tissues. And here's that one mutation um, uh, blown up now and, and you can see it over here. So there is a tighter interaction and that may have a lot to do with why we're seeing more transmissibility. The good news is all of the vaccines that we've developed to the original lineages work just as well against the, this UK variant. So don't worry if you're vaccinated, you're well protected against the UK variant. The problem is going to come next year um, when we start to see other variants. For instance, the one out of South Africa, the one out of Brazil has an, a second mutation, which causes even tighter interactions. And this one 
now means that the vaccines don't work as well. The levels of virus neutralizing antibody are not quite as high uh, and therefore we get reduced protection. So we're probably going to wind up getting a boost to protect against this variant and a very similar one from Brazil either later this year or next year. So if you got the two dose Moderna or Pfizer vaccine, don't be surprised if you're told you need a third immunization later in the year with and that boost will elevate virus neutralizing antibodies even more and maybe specifically fine tune to be specific for the for the South African and, and Brazil variant. And all of the vaccines work the same way. I, I was in a in my in the Uber on the way over here because uh, my wife had a doctor's appointment. Um, the uh, the Uber driver is telling me no he's waiting to get get a particular vaccine. And I told him in as nice a way as I could, don't wait, because all of the vaccines work by the same way. They all work by inducing virus neutralizing antibodies to the spike protein. So people perseverate a lot on the mRNA or DNA vaccine or adenovirus vaccine or the one we're developing, uh, don't wait. They all work by the same uh, mechanisms and all more or less do the same thing. It's just a different delivery system for, for presenting the spike protein in that receptor binding domain to the immune system. But what we are seeing is differences in, um, they all protect pretty well uh, against the original lineages, but they, um, they don't seem to do as well against ZA, the South African and the Brazil. So there is a decline there. And then we'll, so we will likely start making boosts uh, for all of these vaccines later on. We don't have to worry about it right away. Um, the, with the B117, one from UK is gonna be the one with us in the foreseeable future, but down the line. What I do worry about, even though I think the US is gonna be in good shape uh, by the summer, that's not the case for much of the rest of the world, especially the low and middle income countries in Latin America, India, and Africa. Here's the challenge. The challenge is we've got 1.1 billion people living in Sub-Saharan Africa, 650 million people in Latin America, 400 million uh, people in low income uh, Asian countries. That's 2 billion people we're talking about 4 billion doses of vaccine. And the question is, where does that come from? And, and who's going to make that? And the problem is this, those great vaccines that I just told you about, the mRNA vaccines, the adenovirus-based vaccines, the, the ones um, uh, from J&J &J and Moderna and Pfizer, you can't make them in bulk quantity. You can't make enough of the new technology vaccines uh, in order to scale to make 4 billion doses. So the problem and a, and a science policy failure was that everybody was so focused on innovation that all they thought really was, oh, we just got to make enough for the US and Europe. Nobody thought that we, what are we going to do to make 4 billion doses for the rest of the world? And, and that's where we come in. So we have a center for uh, uh, at Texas Children's and Baylor College of Medicine, that's headed by myself and my science partner for the last 20 years, Mary Elena Batazzi, where we're developing uh, low cost vaccines for global health. We've developed vaccines for schistosomiasis and Chagas disease. These are parasitic infections in low income countries. And we adopted a coronavirus vaccine program about 10 years ago because it was orphaned just like everything else. Nobody cared about coronavirus vaccines back then. So we were able to hit the ground running in order to develop one for COVID-19. We just took our original recombinant protein platform and adapted it to uh, for, uh, for COVID-19. And we were able to raise funds in order to then transfer the technology to this very interesting organization here called Biological E or BioE. They are one of the world's largest vaccine producers uh, based in India. We were able to, with Emory University, we were able to show it protects really well in non-human primates at their primate center. And now Biological E is finishing phase two clinical trials, which are looking really good right now. So this is a old school vaccine. It's a recombinant protein vaccine expressed in this yeast Pichia pastoris. And the reason that's relevant, that's the same technology used to make the hepatitis B vaccine that's been around for 40 years. So it's a, so it's got a proven track record. Um, it's on alum together with uh, this oligonucleotide from Dynavax known as CPG, and seems to be, uh, looks really good in phase one, phase two trials, as well as the non-human primates. And now they're scaling it up to 1.2 billion doses, uh, uh, which is great. So it's, it's not a difficult technology to scale. You can make lots of it. 
And it's got a 40 year track record of safety based on the recombinant hepatitis B vaccine, simple refrigeration. And that hepatitis B vaccine has been given to kids and infants for 40 years. So we think it's going to be a great uh, pediatric vaccine. And here's the cost. It's $1.50 a dose. Um, so it's about the least expensive of all the COVID-19 vaccines as well. Uh, and it would only be 50 cents a dose were it not for the extra dollar we need for the Dynavac CPG. So this is uh, really exciting. And we hope that by the later in the summer, this can start rolling out across uh, the world, uh, maybe by early fall uh, and, and help relieve some of the terrible burden that we're seeing in Africa uh, and Latin America and poor countries of Asia. Um, we also now are starting to better understand some correlates of protection. Uh, this is a little bit of a complicated graph, but it's kind of interesting. It shows that um, if you compare the level of virus neutralizing antibody from your vaccine compared to the level of virus neutralizing antibody in a person who's recovered from COVID, we can, it seems to correlate pretty well with the level of protective efficacy. So if the amount of humoral antibody, virus neutralizing antibody in the vaccine is the same as in convalescent plasma, you know, you're getting about 75% protection. And if you can get above 1.5 to two, you're getting 80, 90% protection. And that's what, what we think we're gonna be able to achieve with our recombinant uh, protein vaccine. So that's exciting as well. Now, the other big problem that we're facing though is a lot of people are refusing to take the vaccine even if it's made available. And uh, it's different, different reasons for different parts of the world. And, and it's fluid, it changes. Uh, and so this is a recent poll I got interviewed by Yamiche Alcindor from PBS because PBS NewsHour constructed this poll with NPR and Marist, and it showed something very interesting. First, you know, back in uh, back in uh, early end of last year, uh, the two most vaccine hesitant groups, groups that said they would could would refuse vaccines even if they're made available or were worried about it, uh, were two two populations, and it wasn't just the PBS uh, NewsHour poll, it was uh, our, poll as, our poll as well, and um, uh, that we did with Texas A&M, as well as a poll uh, that we did with, um, uh, as well as a poll done by Kaiser Family Foundation, and they both found that African-American groups and white Republicans, as they were called, or Trump voters, another survey were called, were the two most vaccine hesitant groups. And everybody was sort of stunned by that because you, you, know, you, think, you don't think of those two groups as being on the same page and, and, and a lot of those things. But that, and, and it turns out the reasons were quite different. And so in response to that, you know, I began going on uh, podcasts and, and radio programming to uh, address uh, black and brown uh, audiences, uh, talk shows and, and podcasts. And, and then the numbers started going down and I'd, something very interesting happened to me last week. I was on a podcast with uh, run by a, one of the a black churches in Richmond, Virginia. And I was talking, it was run by a pediatrician together with the pastor of his church. And I was asking them, you know, you know, based on the polls, it looks like vaccine hesitancy and refusals going down in, in black and brown communities. And they affirmed that. They said, yep, it's definitely getting better. It's not perfect. We still have issues, but it's getting better. And I said, well, what do you, what's your thought on why that's why why things are getting better from that standpoint? And he offered, well, you know, part of it, he said, is docs like you reaching out to communities. But the other is the clergy. The clergy, um, when they saw what was happening, they created this informal network and they said, we're not going to let this happen. And they really worked hard to, you know, raise awareness about the importance of getting vaccines in, in, in the black communities. And, and I think that's made a big difference. And, I, and, and that's what he said. And I, I agree with him. I think that that's been a, that's been a game changer. But we have this problem still among uh, these groups over here. And, and why is that? And I thought I'd go into a little bit um, the, the history of uh, all of that. Um, and, and how vaccine hesitancy began in the United States so you could understand it a little bit better. And again, this is a, a great challenge for, um, especially for the social scientists at, at, at um, University of Houston, clearly. So the, 
the anti-vaccine movement is is interesting, and and I unfortunately have become an expert on this, not by choice, but by necessity, because I have a daughter with autism and and intellectual disabilities, and the 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 way the anti-vaccine movement started out was claiming that vaccines cause autism. So I wrote a book called Vaccines Did Not Cause Rachel's Autism, and that made me kind of public enemy number one with the anti-vaccine groups. And so I got a lot of experience going up against them. And this all began starting in the late uh, 1990s, early 2000s. So I've been doing this for 20 years. And then what happened was around six years ago in 2015, there was a switch. The I think the anti-vaccine groups were losing steam. They were losing momentum because a number of us were successful in refuting any links between vaccines and autism. So to re-energize, they they pivoted uh, to politics. They be, they integrated themselves in the Republican Tea Party under this fake banner of health freedom and medical freedom, and that's still with us today. And now. We're seeing version 3.0, which is a globalization. And I thought I'd just take you quickly uh, through those version one, two, and three. So version one, vaccines and autism, that in itself is a series of moving goalposts because originally their assertion was measles, mumps, rubella vaccine caused it. And then they switched it up, said no. As we debunk that link, they switched it up, said no, we didn't mean MMR vaccine, we meant thimerosal preservative in the vaccine. And then each time the scientific community would respond, but then the anti-vaccine groups would keep moving back the goalposts because you'd have to refute another research. And then it was spacing vaccines or Alleman vaccines. Then they even began getting out of the autism space and talking about the HPV vaccine for cervical cancer and other cancers claiming it causes infertility and autoimmunity and then switching to chronic illness. And so um, a number of us have been working really hard in the community to, to do this. This is me with Rachel over here, my youngest daughter who has autism and intellectual disabilities. I think that's, we're in Torchy's Taco there before Torchy's Tacos prior to the, uh, prior to the pandemic um, and wrote this book. And it's been really challenging going up against these groups. Um, the lead, one of the lead anti-vaccine activists, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. has publicly labeled me the OG villain, uh, which I had to look up. It means original gangster villain. So uh, Dr. Wooten, you've invited the original gangster villain to, uh, to for your presidential lecture. I hope you know that. Um, uh, and and it's it's been it's been a real challenge. And the other thing I do in the book, other than show that there's no link between vaccines and autism, the science behind it, explain what autism is and how it be, begins in early fetal brain development through the action of more than a hundred genes. This is a paper from the Broad Institute at Harvard MIT, showing how the genes are expressed in early uh, brain development. Most are expressed in enriched in early and excitatory inhibitory neuronal lineages, a lot of them are in the neuronal cytoskeleton. So we wound up doing whole exome sequencing of, of Rachel and my wife and I, and uh, we identified a new gene that's related to the ones published by the, Har the Harvard Broad Institute, Harvard MIT Broad Institute, and um, it's a non-red cell spectrum, a neuronal spectrum. So the point is we have a very solid alternative uh, to to trying to implicate uh, vaccines. But then what happened was the movement shifted um, starting in uh, around 2014, 2015. What, what was happening, it began in Orange County, California where uh, parents were opting their kids out of getting vaccinated because of fears about autism to the point where it triggered a major, a major measles epidemic in 2014, 2015 in, in Orange County, California. And the California legislature responded by shutting down vaccine exemptions. So parents had to get their kids vaccinated to go to school. And this triggered the next iteration of the anti-vaccine movement under health freedom, medical freedom, basically saying, you can't tell our kids what to do. And again, what tell us what to do about our kids. And this then amplified though in Texas, it really moved to Texas in a big way. And now we're at the point where you have 72,000 kids in the state of Texas denied access to their vaccinations. It's not so bad in this part of Texas, you know, where we are uh, in southeastern Texas, but it's the suburbs of Austin are, are really bad and, and up in Plano and Denton and, and North Texas and, and, and even the formation of a political action committee linked to the Tea Party known as Texans for Vaccine Choice that was created 
together with the Texas Freedom Caucus of the Texas legislature, they really got involved in going and being against vaccines. And, and unfortunately, then this Austin became a home for all these podcasters who are against vaccines like Alex Jones and Del Bigtree. So we really had a mess on our hands that blew up in last year in 2020, because those same anti vaccine groups that were against vaccines then uh, under this banner of health freedom, medical freedom, again, went up against uh, masks and social distancing. So that what was an anti-vaccine movement is now full on anti-science movement, basically any kind of COVID prevention um, is, is, is under attack, including uh, attacking uh, scientists. And so this is our new political reality and, and that it's broadened across the Republican Party, across the GOP, which is another interesting aspect because, you know, as scientists, we're always told, you know, hey, you're a scientist, you're not a political person, don't go into the political realm. But how else do you talk about it, you know, when it's right in front of you? And 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 now, you know, we've got, and I was going on Fox News regularly and, and until I had a, you know, called out a lot of the disinformation campaign last year coming out of the Trump White House claiming that vaccines, uh, that that COVID-19 is a hoax or that it's not a severe illness. And then now, unfortunately, you've got Tucker Carlson on, on Fox News went on a big rant uh, last week against vaccines. So this is really worrying me that what was sort of in the fringe element on the Republican Party is now mainstream in the Republican Party. And then I had Laura Ingram go after me last week. She went on this whole tirade against, she calls, I forget what she calls us, the, med, um, the media medical cartel. That's, that's what I am. Here I am with Vivek Murthy, the Surgeon General, and, and Tony Fauci. And, you know, the problem there is Tony and, and Vivek, you know, they're federal employees. So they get, they get the Secret Service and protection. What I have, you know, Anne and my wife and Rachel and the cat, you know, that's, that's my protection. So uh, it was a little bit unfair, I thought, but, but there you are. So I'm being targeted. The other piece to this, besides the Fox News and News Corp and the attacks on scientists, they have now got two major think tanks backing them with all sorts of crazy ideas. So the Hoover Institution at Stanford University and the American Institute for Economic Research in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. These are, um, so this has now become full on mainstream of the political right going up against science, which, you know, has never used to be that way. The, Re the Republican Party was never anti-science. So, you know, Lincoln, who was a Republican, started the National Academy of Science. Eisenhower launched NASA. George W. Bush launched, Pep launched PEPFAR. So how we walk this back, I think, is going to be one of the great challenges. And their latest concern now is around vaccine mandates. Even though nobody was talking about mandates, they kind of invented the straw man. And I think part of this is kind of a tribal call to maintain the tribe and maintain their um, uh, political allegiance. So now they're, they're filing all, all the state legislatures that are, which have a Republican majority are filing bills now going up against vaccine mandates and passports, even though nobody's talking about vaccine ma pa mandates and passports, except possibly for hospitals and, and for some of the colleges. Then finally in version 3.0, we have the fact that this is globalized now. So it was confined to Texas and the United States. We've now exported to European capitals. So in Western Europe last summer, we'll see what happens this summer. In London, Paris, Berlin, there were anti-mask, anti-vaccine protests. And, and the New York Times and, and BBC reported that it was linked to QAnon and political far-right extremism, even neo-Nazi groups. So we've got now this, what we've got really a globalized anti-science movement. And of course, to make it even more complicated, um, US and British intelligence report now that the Russian government is piling into this, they have launched this whole program of what's being called weaponized health communication. So they're filling our internet with divisive statements against vaccines and science and trying to use this to destabilize our democracy. So this is a, a whole new uh, dimension dimension as well. So um, I wrote a piece last week that was came out in Scientific American that made the following statement that, that this anti-science movement is escalating going global and, and killing thousands. And so that people who are dying of COVID are, yes, they're dying because of the SARS coronavirus, but they're also dying because of deliberate defiance of masks and social distancing and, and now vaccines. 
And, and when you add up the numbers from people who are dying from anti-science, it's formidable. And, and we don't, we've not put in place any infrastructure to combat it. You know, we put a lot of infrastructure in place around, um, around nuclear proliferation. We put infrastructure in place around combating terrorism. And my argument is we've got to do something about this, even though it's unpleasant and inconvenient, I think it's reached that point. So uh, this is the new book that just came out, Preventing the Next Pandemic, Vaccine Diplomacy in a Time of Anti-Science. And, and, I, and I think we are dealing with this anti-science empire and it's, uh, and maybe in the discussion, we can talk about what are some of the things that we have to do to address it. So. I'll stop there so we can leave lots of time for questions. And I said a number of things, some of them are provocative and, and I hope uh, it stimulates some discussion. Outstanding, that was such a wonderful, concise um, bit of information that covered so many uh, different aspects of this pandemic. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, a couple of follow-up questions and then we can, I think perhaps uh, segue away to the to the question and answer. Uh, Dr. Hotez, uh, you, you caught my interest at one point. Uh, as you know, I'm very much interested and have done a lot of work in the area of team science with NIH funded institutions over the last 12 or so years. I'm very curious on your opinion. Uh, uh, what have we learned about collaborative team science uh, over the last year that perhaps we didn't know or fully realized before? Uh, it strikes me that this uh, pandemic was a perfect test for um, the emerging areas uh, of collaborative, particularly multi-institutional, um, multi-institutional scientific teams. Uh, your thoughts there, please. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And, um, you know, there are not a lot of silver linings to this pandemic, but one of them is, you know, the scientific groups really tried to help one another. I think everybody was so upset and so scared that, something got put in place where we we're all going to try to work together to help each other. And, and my life, uh, the bad part is my life is one long zoom call. I wake up, you know, early in the morning, you know, we're, we're just talking to scientists. We're trying to figure out what the heck is going on because the information is coming pretty fast and to assimilate it all, you've got to figure out what's important and what's not. So I have at least, so for instance, after this, right after this, I, we, I do a regular weekly, Zoom call with um, Mike Osterholm, who you've heard probably a lot on, on TV, and Eric Topol is this brilliant uh, physician scientist at UCSD, and and Peggy Hamburg, former FDA commissioner, and 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 a few others, and you know because we're all trying to filter out what's what's important to know and what's not, and we and we share that with each other. And I do three or four different calls like that. I do I'll do another one tonight with. Um, with my science partner, Mary Elena Batazzi, together with David Caslow from PATH and Jerome Kim from IVI. Then I do another one with the former CBER head, uh, Jesse Goodman, he, he's got one and we, and you need to do that. So that's really gratifying. Um, also, you know, the, the journal editors have been really good about putting their information up really quickly, you know, doing rapid review. And if they can't do a rapid review, they, they give the green light to put it up on a preprint server like BioArchive and MedArchive, um, which is not peer reviewed, but it's meant to put up there so the scientific community could see it. So you noticed a couple of my, the stuff I put up there is just fresh from BioArchive and MedArchive. And the reason uh, we knew we could make a vaccine was because the Chinese scientist had put up on BioArchive on January 14th, the COVID-19 sequence. That allowed us to hit the ground running. So despite what you know, you're hearing about the Chinese and this and that, the, the, the truth is the information sharing among the scientists has been pretty good. Now the, the policymakers, not so much. And, and, um, and then you have some bad behavior too, you know, what, what the Russians are doing with the Gamalaya vaccine. You know, they've, they've, they've bypassed WHO pre-qualification. They started marketing their vaccine to countries in a very transactional way, almost like a Cold War kind of way. And then at the same time, they've been piling on anti-vaccine messages against the other vaccines. And so, you know, I had an argument with one of the um, um, lead people from Gamalea, and, you know, I thought I was being unfairly discrediting his vaccine. I said, look, you know, Crimea River, you know, here, you're the, you're responsible for the, 
single largest amount of anti-science disinformation against vaccines and now it's coming back to bite you and you're upset at me and you know, you know I didn't put up with that for a minute but but that's what that's what we're dealing with so it's a lot of not so good geopolitics around science that I think we need to fix and and that's what the book talks about as well it talks about how you know, some of the forces that are driving the return of the disease, even before COVID, are things like war and political collapse and climate change and urbanization. And, and we don't get training in any of those things as scientists. Um, and, and maybe it's time to rethink how we, how we do think about science education, because we tend to, you know, cone it down very quickly in our specialized field. And yet the things that are affecting us are, are often outside that, or that field as well. Wonderful. Dr. Aadi, do you have a follow-up question for Dr. Hotez? And then perhaps we'll turn it to the uh, faculty panel for questions, uh, as well as the general audience. Thank you. I think, you know, Dr. Hotez, thank you so much for all you've said. It's sometimes heavy on our hearts when we hear all that's going on, with, especially with the new variants. Uh, just to lighten it up a bit, I think my question is, how do you see 2022? Uh, compared to 2021 or even 2020? Do you think, how is it going to be different or the same? I think it's going to be varied depending on where you are in the world. Um, so uh, I think by this summer, I don't know that it'll be completely normal, but people will be fully vaccinated by the fall. I think all the high school students, middle school students could be vaccinated and teachers and staff. So that's going to go well. I think transmission will be way down so we can safely open up you know, all the elementary schools for the little kids and the special needs kids. So I think that's going to go well. Um, I think, you know, if transmissions is down as much as I'm predicting, then it means the restaurants, bars, you know, music concerts, uh, you know, I can't say it's an entirely normal life. I mean, it may be that transmission go, they may have a seasonal basis. It may start going up again next January. So there may be periods where we have to put on masks again, but I think for the most part, masks can start to come off in, in, in the in the um, uh, in, in the summer or by the fall. I also think, though, people are going to have a lot of difficulty with their, their transition. I mean, I, I see it in myself now. I'm I I know what it means to come into work every day, and I know what it means to be at home all the time. But now I've got this kind of hybrid, and I always feel at odds. I mean, I'm. I mean, right now I'm coming here, I'm talking to you from my office um, and, and I'm not even sure why I come into the office because I'm just doing the same damn Zoom calls that I would do from home, but I'm just sitting here by myself in my office, but it just makes me feel more normal to get fully dressed and, and come into work and have my wife drive me in and pick me up like the old days just to feel like you're getting back into something. I think, and, and I think people are gonna have a tough time with that transition. There's gonna be a lot of, I don't know if I wanna call it PTSD, but there's gonna be a lot of difficulty and a lot of mental health issues. I think all employers are gonna to have to deal with. And, um, and in your case, both for both for staff and teachers, as well as the, the students that there's gonna be, it's, it's, it, it's not gonna just because we're not wearing masks anymore by the fall and, and transmissions down. I think there's still gonna be a lot of mental health issues also because of the COVID itself is causing long, long haul mental health issues. Um, you know, about a third of COVID patients report um, some symptoms, whether it's heart palpitations or shortness of breath or brain fog or depression. So, you know, there's going to be getting ready for all the mental health issues is going to be a big deal. Mm -hmm. Then I think in 2022, we might get boosted uh, with against variants. So I think in overall the U.S. and the economy is going to pick up. You'll see the oil and gas industry start to pick up, I think, as people are traveling. Uh, it won't be fully back to normal, though, because other countries won't have the benefit of vaccinations like we do. So if you look at who will be fully vaccinated by the fall, I think it'll be the U.S., maybe Canada, uh, the U.K., some Western European countries, and Israel, and maybe a couple of the Middle Eastern countries. That's it. So... It's, it means that travel to Latin America is going to be treacherous. It means travel to Africa is going to be treacherous. It means travel to 
um, certain countries in Asia are going to be treacherous and it's hard, you know, and we're in a very interconnected world and, and, and that's going to be uh, uh, an issue as well. And, and that's why we're working so hard on, on our recombinant protein uh, vaccine to get it out there, uh, because I think we're going to need that for our very interconnected economy. Wonderful. Well, let's um, take a minute to take a few questions from our faculty panel, and then we'll open it up to the general public. So why don't we start with Dr. Custers and Dr. Mitchell. So Dr. Custers, I know you have a question or two that you specifically wanted to, uh, to address to Dr. Hotez. So if you will unmute and please uh, ask, uh, ask Dr. Hotez your question, please. Or thank you, Dr. Hotez, for your time and sharing your expertise today. It was very interesting to hear your perspective um, and, and knowledge. Um, you presented a lot of information about vaccine hesitancy, uh, which is very important in obviously getting shots in arms, um, but that's only a piece of the puzzle. Uh, we also need to consider access, um, as you stated, and we've seen a disproportionate burden of COVID infection and testing disparities um, and recovery disparity uh, for racial and ethnic minorities, linguistic minorities, sexual minorities, people in rural areas. Um, so what is the most, what are, what will be, and what are the most important factors um, ensuring equitable access to the vaccines once hopefully we have enough um, doses for everybody um, so that these vulnerable populations don't get left behind now that we have more of a mass rollout? Yeah, no, it's a very important question. And now I'm sitting on a Rockefeller Foundation um, vaccine hesitancy advisory, vaccine equity advisory board. And one of the statements that we're all making, or I was on one yesterday, two days ago. And one of the statements is, you know, we, let's not even talk about vaccine hesitancy now in the African-American community, because that obscures the real issue, which is access. Uh, and I, you know, there's still a little bit of vaccine hesitancy there. Now the anti-vaxxers are have created this horrible documentary that compares the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine to Tuskegee experimentation, and that's gonna cause a lot of damage. But aside from that, I think the big issue is, is access. And um, I think the Biden administration has been very committed to this. I know here in Houston, the mayor and um, the Harris County judge, Lena Hidalgo has been very committed to that. And what they've been doing is trying to open up as many vaccination sites in low-income neighborhoods as possible. Because when it was first set up, it was very much around the pharmacy chains. And even though I think, you know, HEB and the, the big pharmacy chains have done a good job, there's just not that many pharmacies in low-income neighborhoods. I mean, they're, they're pharmacy deserts, just like their gross, just like their grocery store chain deserts. And so making certain that, that that's available is gonna be a, a, a big issue. Um, I think also, re, you know, certain communities are, you know, can be insular at times, and so they're not getting a lot of public health information. So, for instance, you know, some of the Hispanic communities here around here in Houston, um, they're just not, they're just not glued to MSNBC and CNN all the time. Who knew that, right? So, so you know, reaching those communities. So I've been trying to go on, you know, Univision and and um, and um, and Telemundo and my oldest daughter is very embarrassed by my Spanish, which is just awful. Um, but you know, doing that, and I think that helps a little bit. But even then, you know, some people don't even own TVs, and and so getting getting good public health communication. I think the trans, similar to some of the elements of the transgender community are not, you know, they're, they're for their own, for own, for their own protection and security can be insular at times as well, and and reaching those groups, I think that's really important. So we do have a lot of work to do. The Biden administration is putting out a lot of PSAs, public service announcements to reach different groups. I think that's good. I don't think that's going to be enough, though. I think we're going to have to figure out how to improve their communication. I mean, if you see how they do it, I, it's, it, to me, it's it's not impressive. I mean, you, you've seen, you know, when you hear from the CDC director or Tony, and they they've got they have got this Hollywood Squares things going, where everyone's in these boxes and and the lighting is awful. It's dark in rooms with ghostly lighting and I even said, I said, guys, you look like Kim Jong Un sitting there. You've got to, you've got to figure out a different way to uh, communicate. Um, and I think the other piece to this is how scientists communicate. You know, one of the things that um, I saw last year with the, the the Trump White House Coronavirus Task Force 
is they, you know, spoke in very simple ways and didn't explain their assumptions. And, and I think it was very off-putting. I mean, they would talk to the American people like they were in the fourth grade or sixth grade. And I think somebody, you know, in, in communication school or journalism school told them that's how you have to talk about science, like the American people are in the sixth grade. And it's not true. I mean, I think one of the things that I've learned is people do tolerate complexity, especially if their life depends on it. And, and I think what I got a lot of positive reinforcement about going on CNN and MSNBC and the other networks was I would go into some complexity and, and explain my assumptions and people liked it. They, they liked hearing from scientists and they didn't necessarily want everything filtered through the anchors and the journalists. And, and, and they had their role too, but I think people like to hear directly from scientists and like to see that scientists are real people with emotions and, and I learned it was okay to cry on CNN or show a flash of uh, show a flash of anger at times. And and I think that is another role for the universities because we don't teach science communication in our science in our STEM education, either at the undergraduate or graduate or postdoctoral level. And I think we're Young, the commitment to young pe the commitment from young people for public service, I, I find is an, an all time high. They want to be out there. They want to be talking and but we're not giving them the tools to do it or we're not also not creating the ecosystem for it. I mean, for instance, I, you know, I get evaluated like everybody else and on my evaluation form, it's all about my grants and papers. There's nothing on there even for the books I've written or the or going on the cable news channels or op-eds I've written and because it's not important. It's not considered important to an academic health center or many universities um, and certainly not, nothing for, for Twitter, right? So, so I think that also has to be fixed as well. We, I think we have to create a new ecosystem around science communication actually and, and send the message to young scientists that it's important um, because right now we don't do that in any way. Wonderful. Uh, uh, let's now move to uh, Dr. Mitchell. I know you have a question, and then we'll take a couple of questions from the general audience. Dr. Mitchell. Hi there, Dr. Hotez. Th thank you again for spending some time with us this morning. Uh, I had a quick question, particularly with the B117 variant, uh, particularly the risk in uh, children. Um, I uh, know that you mentioned that earlier in the presentation. Uh, but particularly, um, I, I, I understand that the, uh, that the main three vaccines currently are, 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 um, uh, are approved for either 16 or 18 year olds and up. Um, and I do understand that there are uh, trials going on now for 12 year olds and up. Um, when when uh, could we maybe expect um, uh, K through five or preschool children uh, to have access to these vaccines? Yeah, no, it's an important question. Um, in the, um, I think for the adolescents, there's a lot of pressure to have them vaccinated by the, over the summer in order to have them in, vaccinated in the schools. Uh, and so I think we'll likely see emergency use authorization expansions uh, for that. Um, remember also these vaccines were never formally approved. They've only been released through EUA and that has to happen too. So that might be the mechanism uh, getting an actual biologics license application. I think for the little kids, it's gonna take longer in part um, because you know, kids with COVID one of the rare syndromes is something called MISC. I don't know who comes up with these acronyms, but it's stands for multi-system inflammatory syndrome of kids. And it's serious, maybe even life-threatening, requires often pediatric ICU admission. There's been about 2000 cases. Peak is in five to nine year olds. And it seems to be um, late in the course of the illness. In other words, the kid has been had the virus for a few days or weeks and then gets it. So it's an inflammatory or immune response to the virus. And, and because of that, I think the people testing vaccines will want to make certain that the vaccines don't make that worse or trigger that uh, in any way. And I think that's going to slow us down a bit. So I don't see um, the kids, the little kids having access to COVID-19 vaccines till next year. Um, 
And then we're going to have to decide how far down you go because now we're vaccinating pregnant women and they have antibodies that are transferred to the, to the unborn baby. So the baby's born with antibodies, which is a good thing. The newborns now will be protected against COVID, but it could mean that the antibodies will interfere with the vaccines for the first six months of life, almost like measles. So the vaccine, potentially I could envision a scenario where the vaccine is given like the measles vaccine at one, one year of age down the line, but that'll take a while to get there. Wonderful. Let's, um, let's take a question now from the general audience. So this, to some extent, piggybacks on something you said just a moment ago. Uh, the question asks, once you receive either a Pfizer or a Moderna vaccine, do you always have to have that booster shot uh, downstream? That's certainly the preference because that's where all the data will be collected. If you start mixing and swapping vaccines, there won't be data to support whether that works well or not. Um, and and we'll also have to look at it from a safety point of view. So the CDC is for the second dose has said, if you absolutely don't have access to anything else, go ahead and take it. But we just don't have a lot of data to support it. So I think it'll always be optimal to get try to get the same type of vaccine that you got before, unless FDA has looked at it more clear, carefully and, and finds that it's worth recommending uh, an alternative. Great. Here's a second question from our general audience. Um, and it states, how can higher ed, higher education, help chip away at the politicization of, uh, of public health? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. I think, um, well, first of all, I think it's important to point out the scientists didn't politicize this, this stuff. It's the politicians politicized it. And, and that was very hard for me because, you know, especially when you saw the disinformation campaign come out <coughs> last year saying COVID was a hoax and the deaths are due to other causes and the spect spectacularization of hydroxychloroquine. I had to go into that political arena and it was a scary place. Um, but I felt, you know, here I was an expert in anti-science disinformation campaigns. If I don't do it, no one else is going to do it. And that was tough to to do that. And, you know, I almost refrained from doing it. And Anne, my wife said, look, if you don't call it out and don't do all you can, you know, when you see all the people who lose their lives from COVID-19, you're going to feel terrible if you don't. And that's, that's all I needed to hear. But so I think navigating that space is really challenging. It's, and there's a lot of minefields. Um, so how you do it and how you do it ethically is I think really daunting. Um, glad I did it, but, um, but it means that the, the, that the first step of disentangling the anti-science out of the politics is to figure out a path by which scientists can talk about the politics and feel safe doing it. Uh, especially here in Texas, especially with public institutions, uh, right? Because you don't want to offend the people in the Texas legislature. You don't want to offend the governor, the lieutenant governor. So how, how you do that is, uh, is a very, is a carefully orchestrated dance, which sometimes I get right, sometimes I don't. And so that, that ha that's the first step, I think, uh, in, in addressing it. And, uh, and then being able to talk about talk about it in frank terms and non-judgmental terms um, is, is not easy as well. So this is, uh, so that if it sounds like I'm, I'm evading your question, <laughs> I sort of am but <laughs> because I don't have, I don't really have the answer, um, but I, I do know it could be a minefield and I do, but I do know it's necessary. Um, and, and again, this is why we need full service universities. It would be great to do just this kind of, just do a focus session at UHCL, bring together the political scientists with the scientists. How do we figure this out? Because, because if one of the other lessons we've learned from this epidemic is we have to have an uncomfortable dialogue with um, people outside our, our discipline. And we're not going to solve this vaccine problem, for instance, just with chemistry and molecular biology. You could have throw all the great science at it you want, and we've already learned that that's not enough. So getting disciplines to talk to each other, I think is gonna be really key. Wonderful. Uh, let's go ahead and ask Dr. Aminet to address this question, and then uh, Dr. Alexander, and then we'll sum up this uh, first part of the program. Dr. Aminet. 
All right, thank you. So my first question is how much of the chemistry is gonna be on the exam? Um, but uh, no, thank you very much for, for the great lecture. Really uh, appreciate your thoughts, your leadership in the community. Uh, I have a couple of science questions, but I wanna really focus my question back to one is being a dad. So I have uh, multiple kids who are in elementary school. And we're getting information now from the, the school district, from the board, saying that they're meeting to discuss potentially easing up on some of the public health measures right now in school, mask, um, th things of that nature. I'm wondering how we communicate science with school boards, uh, with decision makers that are um, looking at potentially making changes right now when it sounds like with this new variant that may not be the best idea. Yeah, no, I, I, and I've been speaking a lot with school boards and teachers and superintendents. And, and I think the first thing I always say is, you know, I don't have all the answers either. We're, we're, you know, we uh, charting, predicting the path of a pandemic is, is fraught with a lot of challenges. What I would say though, is we do know the B117 variant is here right now it's accelerating the cases are still down in texas we still think it's going to go start going up and we know kids and younger people are more susceptible to this new variant than they were the original lineages and what i say is we're not unlike in the past when i didn't have any bracket on the right hand side I just said, you know, do this and we'll figure out what to do later. Now we can say we could be fully vaccinated by the summer. And yes, we can do this very safely. Let's just try to be conservative and keep a lid on it for the next few weeks. We're not even, you know, we're not talking even years or even many months. I think by June, we're going to be in a much better shape. So all we're really asking is we, we know there's going to be a fourth peak. And that's where in that now and the whether or not the peak is like this or like this all depends on how careful we are. And, and so that's the message I've been trying to send. And I know people are exhausted. They're fed up. Um, they want to get back and, and, you know, and, and there's incongruity, right? You see, you know, the opening day in, 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 in Minute Maid Park yesterday, even though it was half full, there's still a lot of people there. So why are you telling us now that we have to be careful about schools? Well, it's because we should have delayed the start of baseball season to May 1, which um, which I guess talked talk to everybody out of letting me throw the opening pitch, but, uh, um, but that's what we should have done, I think. Um, again, just hanging out for another six, seven weeks, that's all we're really asking. Right. Uh, we're getting close to the 11 o'clock uh, uh, mark, but I do want to get in Dr. Alexander, Dr. Waldu's questions very quickly. So, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Alexander, if you could uh, briefly describe your question and we can uh, then move to Dr. Waldu, please. Yes, I will. Okay, well, first of all, thank you very much. I always enjoy your speaks. And so as a backdrop to my question, the pandemic, we know will continue to have major aspects um, and impacts on nursing education, especially in our delivery to nurse, uh, nurses who are coming into the profession, who are already in the profession, even retired nurses who wanna come back. So my question to you is, given the magnitude of challenges posed in COVID-19 and the possibility of another event such as this, what do you think would be imperative to include in the training of higher education to help profession students, especially nurses. Yeah, and you know, I think one is acknowledge all the nurses who've suffered um, both emotionally and physically because of COVID-19 and be able to take stock of that and be able to talk about it. I think that that's gonna be really important. I think the, especially in places that got hit hard and. Uh, nurses who took care of so many dying patients and and were the ones that held the hand of patients who were dying while their relatives were on Zoom. I think let's not underestimate the PTSD that's gonna that that the whole profession's gonna suffer uh, because of that. So one addressing mental health challenges around nursing. I think there's gonna be new awareness around that. Um, the physical dangers that that nurses face should not be underestimated. I think also 
at the same time, infection control is going to be an important aspect of nursing. And, you know, a lot of hospitals, nurses are the infection control officer. So I think building that uh, into education, I think a lot of nurses, you know, they all get some training, but I think the level they had to deal with was probably even beyond what many nurses got training. And so building that into education programs, I think is going to be uh, extremely important as well. And how you communicate health and science, that's going to be important. And nurses did quite a bit of that in 2020 and 2021. So I think, um, I think in terms of respect of the profession, um, clearly nursing has gone up, right? I mean, that's, uh, you know, I think if you were to do a pre pre pandemic, post pandemic survey of what profession do you admire the most? Um, uh, I think nurses are going to be at the top. So, and, and that's good in the sense that expect um, your application is going to go up. That's what, that's what I would predict. And the level of interest is going to go up also. So there's a lot, lot there, a lot to work with both positive and negative. Wonderful. Uh, I want to give Dr. Waldu the honor of, if you have time, Dr. Hotez, for one last question. Uh, Dr. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hatez, for this enlightening presentation. So my question is very quick. So um, we have had um, um, emergence and reemergence of global pandemics for decades, but um, the magnitude and distribution and duration of the pandemics, uh, of these pandemics is relatively um, serious and has a lot of, you know, uh, um, in terms of distribution, in terms of duration, compared to the ones that we have experienced over the last 10 years. So what do you think science uh, has learned that's unique to this pandemic? I think, um, you know, the science has produced um, some extraordinary epidemiologic models, knowledge of the virus, patho virus pathogenesis, uh, and some extraordinary vaccines. I think um, the the biggest problem that I see is been um, access uh, to, to innovation and science in both low-income neighborhoods and globally. Um, and so one of the statements that I make in the book is, you know, when we talk about the right of access to food, water, shelter, right of access to essential medicines, we all have to remember that people have a fundamental right of access to innovation as well. And, and we didn't give that access to innovation. It was only meant for a few. And, and that is a, a new type of disparity I think we're gonna have to deal with and, and address. Wonderful. Well, uh, I think we're, we're close to the, uh, our little past the 11 o'clock hour. Uh, Dr. Hotez, I, I simply want to thank you so much for availing your time today. Uh, I feel so much more educated and more knowledgeable about what is likely to occur in the future. And uh, we, I, we all want to simply thank you for your advocacy um, and for your leadership uh, that uh, will help the health of our entire community and indeed the world. So uh, we thank you so very much. And I promise you, I'll take you up on that opportunity to have further dialogues uh, with respect to some of the uh, uh, issues that we uh, that we uh, addressed today. So thank you so very much. We really appreciate your time. Well, thank you. It's been a real honor and I look forward to meeting you all in person and you know, maybe next year or sooner. So uh, let's, we'll, we'll have that to look forward to. I certainly will look forward to it. So thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. All the best. Have a good one. Well, that was uh, needless to say, a wonderful presentation and dialogue. Uh, we're now at the part of our program uh, where we are going to make use of our uh, marvelous uh, faculty uh, in, in terms of a panel discussion. Uh, and so the um, time that we had with Dr. Hotez and the responses that he provided gives us all a considerable amount to think about uh, and to, to dialogue about this morning. So uh, let me go ahead and again uh, suggest that uh, this panel will uh, initially uh, be asked to uh, spend about two minutes each uh, to uh, maybe reflect upon those uh, elements of Dr. Hotez's presentation. They felt particularly compelling uh, and also link it back to uh, higher education. 
So I'll, I'll, I'd like to now uh, turn uh, the helm over to Dr. Aditi and so that she might introduce more formally uh, our, our distinguished faculty panel and then we'll get underway. Thank you. Yes, it's my pleasure to introduce my distinguished colleagues this morning, um, starting with my colleague that we're in the same department, Dr. Jordan Mitchell is an associate professor of healthcare administration in the College of Business. He teaches courses in healthcare finance and healthcare predictive analytics. And he serves as a faculty advisor to the UH Clear Lake Healthcare Financial Management Association chapter. His research focuses on health information technology, healthcare finance and health disparities. And Dr. Isabel Costers is an assistant professor of public health in the Department of Clinical Health and Applied Science. And she's a co-program director of the MS in Exercise and Health Sciences at UHCL. She holds a secondary appointment as a health policy scholar in the Center for Medical Ethics and Health Policy at Baylor College of Medicine. Dr. Costa's research focuses on the impact of social determinants of health on health access and outcomes for immigrants and underserved populations. And Dr. Bill Amonet is an associate professor of exercise science and the executive director of the Health and Human Performance Institute, where he leads the vision and strategic direction for research, programming, and community engagement. Dr. Amonet's research combines systemic physiology biomechanics and model control to study the effects of exercise and nutritional interventions on health and rehabilitative outcomes in people with chronic diseases and neurological injuries. Next, we have Dr. Karen Alexander, who is an assistant professor and the program director for nursing at UHCL. There she strives to design and develop innovative strategies that promote high quality education in a student-centered active learning environment and serves to raise the bar in nursing excellence. Her research focus is on vulnerable populations such as fathers of preterm infants, veterans, and adults and food insecurity. And last but not the least, we have Dr. Dawit Waldu, who is an associate professor of anthropology. He's actually a medical anthropologist and cross-cultural studies. He teaches courses in social medicine, topics on African studies and human sexuality and health and community-based development models in Africa. His research is on the cultural, biological and ecological dimensions of malaria and HIV AIDS in Sub-Saharan Africa, as well as the role of substance abuse and other culturally mediated risk behaviors on the epidemics of HIV AIDS in urban co communities in East Africa, uh, in Eastern Africa. So we have such a broad and amazing uh, group of, of faculty here at U of H Clear Lake, of which here we have just a few. And as we go into this next phase, I'd like to ask uh, you guys to provide your brief perspectives on the key points made by Dr. Hotez. And if applicable, just like we said, the significance of your perspective to higher education. So please limit your comments to about two minutes each. And I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Mitchell, just in the under which I've introduced you. Thank you, Dr. Ayani. Uh, so that, I mean, uh, that was that was an amazing lecture that we that we all just heard. I think we can agree to that. Um, so the 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 items that stuck out in my mind were uh, mainly was the concept of anti-science. Um, uh, yes, most recently it is, it is due to, um, well, I don't know what it's due to, but it's in, in relation to um, the current COVID vaccines. However, one, one, uh, one quick link that Dr. Hotez mentioned was that even back in the early 2000s uh, with the anti-vaccines for uh, autism uh, started in Orange County, California. Um, so to me, there might be a linkage there because yes, California um, as a state 
uh, does lean quite Democratic. However, Orange County itself uh, historically has been Republican. Um, I, I don't know what the link is there. I genuinely don't know, uh, but that, that, that might be something. Um, but yeah, just the anti-vaccines and uh, I'm sorry, the, the anti-science, but also uh, moving forward, uh, trying to link science with uh, more effective communication towards the public. Uh, I, I really do think we need to talk about that in our hour coming up right now. Uh, but the, there is a special need for the, for the general public to view scientists uh, not, only, uh, not only to acknowledge that what they're saying is valid, but um, you know, what is the best way to communicate that across different populations? Because that's another issue right there too. Um, I'm probably bumping up against two minutes. Okay, so I will stop now and um, I, will, um, I will yield the floor. Thank you, thank you. Dr. Costas? Yes, thank you. Um, I was uh, very happy to hear Dr. Hotez um, speak today. And the points that he made are especially relevant to those of us who sit in both worlds of higher education and public health. Um, because as you know, as, as we mentioned throughout um, today's uh, time, students are hearing about public health right on a daily basis from multiple sources. Um, so we, as faculty members, as public health practitioners, have the opportunity to highlight this field um, and make it relevant to all students, regardless of their major. Um, perhaps later in the panel, I'll have the opportunity to expand upon the knowledge and access um, inequalities and inequities that we've seen, especially with minority and underrepresented uh, populations. But I really want to highlight, just as Dr. Mitchell did, um, the importance that Dr. Hotez mentioned of teaching critical thinking skills, teaching science communication um, for various audiences. So we're in the era of quick communication, quick information. Um, so in our program, we actually train and teach students about taking the scientific literature and transforming it into tweets, uh, debate and discussion topics, um, op-eds, short videos. Um, and that's very important because we as scientists can sit in our little science bubble world um, and there's no translation or dissemination of information. Um, integrating these innovative methods of information delivery to our students and then transferring that knowledge to the community along with other methods such as practice-based learning and service-based learning can really help the community even while our students are in their programs, right? We can have internships and practica um, so that while our students are receiving their training um, and education, we can really begin to give back to the community. Um, so happy to go into it more later in the panel, but um, public health is truly an interdisciplinary field and relevant to any major. Um, we, we, we truly need a wide breadth um, and a depth of information and expertise to tackle these very large real world problems uh, focusing on solutions. So thank you. Dr. Abonet, you have the floor. Thank you. And, and so I'll, I'll echo what uh, Dr. Mitchell said a second ago. I think one of the most profound uh, things that was said in, in the lecture, which was incredible, was that people are dying from anti-science. And um, I've never thought about that, like the profound effect that science and the misunderstanding or the fear that can be uh, put in our mind by the misinterpretation of science can truly really have uh, those types of consequences. Uh, and, and the other thing that I took away, the nugget was the effect kind of, of what COVID has had on mental health and, and the fear that we have right now of kind of returning to normalcy as a society. And, and I feel it myself, right? When I'm watching a TV show, and they show people walk into a restaurant without a mask on. It, it just feels like there's something weird or odd about that. And um, you know, I'm honored to, to lead an institute that, that has an opportunity to work with people that are older um, and, and kind of the people who have been dissuaded from going out into public for a really long time. Uh, and and I, I have thought about this throughout the pandemic that we've done a really good job of kind of curbing the spread of acute COVID but while we're doing that, we're also feeding an existing pandemic, which is obesity and metabolic diseases. 
And at some point, we have to find a way to return to normalcy, uh, to find ways to healthily engage in behaviors that, that improve our, our physical health. And as a university, I think we need to look into the future and say, what can we do to be ready to stand in that gap as uh, the next pandemic may occur? Thank you. Uh, Dr. Alexander, you're, you're next. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, so the key points that I kind of got from that presentation, which was a great presentation, by the way, I was glad to hear that he said um, that this is all about nurses now as well and has been brought to the forefront. If you did not know, the year 2020 happened to be the year of the nurses anyway, and that was extended to 21 because of the public awareness regarding the uh, lack of nurse safety that he talked about. And I was really happy to hear that he spoke to that. We all know it's no secret that nurses have been forced to work in some unsafe situations, but this has been even brought more to the forefront since COVID-19. And we know that the unique challenges that most nurses will face integrating um, that resiliency that he talked about that's causing this post-traumatic distress syndrome, PTSD, will affect how they function, how they deliver care, and how for themselves physically and psychologically the impact will be. So I think what is really important is now that we have come into a realm of where nurses are expected to continue to deliver care from behind our personal protective equipment, the intensity and volume of COVID-19 has forced nurse educators to re-examine how we are going to educate and deliver nursing in our programs. And most importantly, keep our students who many of them, especially at our institution, are practicing nurses already coming to excel in education. How do we keep them on that completion track? Because we know that they are not um, going to be retained until they're finished. So the environment now is perfect to, to do just that and be inclusive in how we redesign, reemerge, and relaunch our education for those um, nursing students. And inclusive of bringing nursing back, um, nurses back who have retired or are out of practice and bring them back to the forefront because they wanna get their hands back in. So that's really kind of what I've got out of what he said, on many points I did, but especially that part of the nursing and redesigning what we teach and at the same time, keeping them physically and mentally um, on target. Thank you, Dr. Waldo. Well, thank you so much. I think that was very um, interesting and, and amazing um, um, talk. Um, I think what I found very interesting talking about was um, kind of in, in, in my discipline from, you know, in, in medical anthropology or in anthropology for that matter, we look things from a cross-cultural perspective. So, and we do actually talk about vaccine compliance as, as part of, you know, a topic of interest in my field. And what I saw that was very interesting was kind of, uh, he brought this idea of anti-science versus, you know, uh, what, we, what he calls it vaccine hesitancy even though we don't call it vaccine hesitancy in my field, we call it vaccine compliance. So it, 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 it adds up a new layer of the politicization of vaccine instead of the cultural competence or, you know, or the cross-cultural perspective of it. You know, um, uh, back in the days, there was some ideological you know, uh, reasons behind why people were not taking vaccine. But the idea that how politics has had back in that and capitalized on that, and the new social realities of social media has in some ways kind of weaponized those things uh, into not just like in the United States, but actually even globally. And, and it was very interesting to talk about how he was interacting with the Russian vaccine uh, um, scientists, I think. It, it, that, 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 that was very interesting to me because it tells us um, a new social reality in terms of how we not only communicating, but how we are constructing about uh, ideas of vaccine, about ideas of illness experience, about um, uh, uh, vaccine nationalism. These are areas that are very, very interesting uh, for a lot of us that are involved in, you know, um, um, public health and um, uh, 
medical anthropology and anthropology, um, medical sociology. So th this was that was that was interesting and and, and that's. Thank you. And I'll just kind of round up to say that for me, I mean, it's clear that for all of us, a big issue is how do we, and, and it's also a question that was asked in the chat, chat question and answer from the audience is how do we as faculty, um, you know, help combat this anti-science? That's one of the big things coming out of Dr. Cortez's conversation. Um, how do we, what do we do as faculty in public ed, uh, higher ed help combat that in our classrooms, right? And, and linking that to, you know, we want to be able to do that without being political. Yeah, right? everybody has a right to be, you know, on one side of the political aisle that they are on. So it's not really about a Republican, uh, Democrat issue. It's about science versus anti-science. And it also makes me go back to, you know, I, I did my postdoc at the CDC and spent several years working there prior to coming here. And one of the things that the CDC did well really then was that they had this um, fellowship for journalists in which they felt it was very important to train journalists on how not to sensationalize news <laughs> and to be responsible in how to report science, which is where we are now. So it's really, how do we do that kind of stuff in our classrooms? I think that's the thing that's for me coming out of this conversation that I'm thinking about. So uh, I'm going to hand back to Dr. Wooten to lead us in uh, our next round of questions uh, with regards to uh, the, the second panel. Right. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, it's fascinating some of the uh, threads that have run through uh, what each of our panelists have in fact uh, uh, found most intriguing. Uh, and I hearken back to the beginning of this university as a completely interdisciplinary university. And I think everyone can see uh, that that culture has prevailed and there is indeed even all the more need uh, to continue in that vein. So thank you panelists for your initial observations. Um, I, I think we perhaps over the next uh, number of minutes should really focus on three areas. Uh, and I'd like to draw upon your specific um, interest and expertise from your specific discipline to talk about several things. First, let's let's turn our attention to what have been the lessons learned uh, from your from your discipline, from the lens of your discipline, and then we'll move into the higher education area. What uh, what uh, for example, um, uh, what has been the impact, uh, maybe you, you personally or amongst your colleagues, amongst your students, and then last, what can we do, and what can in fact higher education do. Uh, to help transform um, uh, our, our, our ent entirety, our, our communities, uh, to be uh, more resilient uh, from a public health point of view. So uh, we'll, uh, is there anyone that would like to start off with the issue of uh, lessons learned from your particular discipline? I, I can start if you'd like. Right. Um, I think the pandemic and resulting um, social situation that we've seen has really highlighted for the American public who may not have really understood um, the issue with health insurance and healthcare access being tied to one's employment. And so I think lessons learned going forward um, surrounding issues of employment, paid time off, sick leave, um, access to specific types of care, preventive um, care, um, really the issue of it being tied to employment or unemployment um, is a very large lesson learned. And I think um, that issue for the most part had been uh, kind of under the surface and people had been discussing it, but now it's a much broader issue that people are um, talking about and thinking about. Um, and hopefully we will have some sort of um, uh, solutions at mul multiple levels, right? We can't just do it as the general public. There needs to be a systemic change um, to enable people in times of crisis, such as this COVID-19, um, to access healthcare regardless of their employment status, regardless of their technology literacy or health literacy, language, um, immigration status, etc. That health is is fundamental, and we cannot um, base that on whether or not or what type of job we have. Wonderful. Uh, would someone like to also to build upon that, and then we'll move on to 
uh, the other arenas. Uh, anyone would like to comment on what uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Custer's articulated or have perhaps a different perspective from your given discipline? I can, I, um, I can, uh, I, I, I echo everything that was just said, <laughs> uh, but, but to, to my, my specific uh, healthcare administration, the, the actual providing of healthcare, I think that um, uh, o over the past several years, five to 10 years, uh, telehealth has, has been kind of lurking in the background um, you know, it's, it's, it's been there, but it's kind of been forgotten about, but I think COVID-19, uh, especially in terms of where, where providers get their revenue from, uh, I, I think that since a lot of providers were forced to shift from inpatient, uh, in, inpatient visits, uh, they they shifted more towards telehealth. So I think moving forward, you're going to see a lot more telehealth, and also on the on the reimbursement side of it too, you're going to see a lot of payers um, f not necessarily favor telehealth, but if a patient uh, if a patient's level of acuity would fall, uh, you know, pretty mild, mild to moderate, if if they can get away with a telehealth visit, they'll probably probably might be incentivized to do that. Um, you're seeing that now, especially with the behavioral health side of things too, uh, with, um, you know, talking to a therapist, uh, telehealth is linking providers where they are with patients where they are. Now, an unintended consequence of that may, uh, to Dr. Custer's point, may be the widening of disparities. Um, because you have certain people with better access to broadband, better access to uh, cell phones, tablets, etc. Um, so you, you're probably going to see a widening of those disparities. But that I don't believe we have a social worker in our panel. But you know, training people uh, to to, I mean, but it's not just training. You actually have to provide the broadband too. So as a whole infrastructure push too. And I, I, I know the word infrastructure is kind of a hot button like this week. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stay away from that. Uh, but uh, that's, that's, that's generally what, what I am seeing right now and what I think I might see uh, in the near future. Great. Thank you. Let's move on to um, an area uh, very dear uh, to our hearts, which is the higher education. So um, perhaps one of you would like to um, start this component off with some reflections upon maybe yourself as an educator, uh, perhaps your students, perhaps the nature of what we do and how we do it. What has been the really big impact uh, upon higher education from your perspective? So would someone like, uh, who, someone who's not- Kevin, I don't mind, I don't mind stepping in. Um, and only because the segue that was um, set by my two colleagues kind of fits right into what I was going to talk about anyway. So as um, we were talking about the major of impact for me and for the program of nursing that I see and hearing other fellow colleagues is the way that we are going to be expected to deliver care. And so we know that nurses possess unique skills and it allows them to deliver very specialized technical skills. But those skills are typically not only the skills we learn, but they're grounded in human acts of caring. And in short, I guess I would have to say that nurses humanize healthcare, right? Especially when Dr. Hotez was talking about holding hands of dying patients and so forth. For us, we had to not only expect our students in our nursing program, which at the time was primarily face-to-face, -face, we did not um, realize that we had to not expect them to just transition to remote learning because we didn't use online learning, but remote learning. We also had to focus on the concepts of what our program is built on, which is leadership, patient advocacy, professionalism, and so forth. But 
we didn't, when you talk about lessons learned, we didn't realize how much that focus was really going to move towards resiliency. And as it relates to being that nurse, that manager, we found this that it was very important to focus on those traits and to go back, in fact, and look at the graduates that we had and build, we actually did a study to build to see, are we really giving them those traits that built on their career on the front lines to help them be resilient. So in fact, they can be those good leaders, those good managers. And COVID-19 was the crisis that showed us that's what we needed to do. And lastly, I talk about the practice of care, as we said before, we know even before COVID-19 that many nurses were moving away from the bedside, but we do need those bedside nurses. However, on the other hand, as my colleague said, we need the telehealth as well. We need the telehealth and we need informatics. We need nurses to support the front lines and the data and analysis of the current atmosphere and the future. I tell my students this all the time. We cannot allow other people to do research about nurses. Nurses have to do their own informatics, their own research about nursing. So I would say that's um, what we're doing. We're moving into um, a new realm of delivery of healthcare and making it so that students can attend in class, out of class, either way. And then also just focusing on that resiliency. Wonderful. Uh, Dr. Waldu or Dr. Aminette, you have uh, uh, something similar or to add or perhaps different from your perspective? Um, I can go. Um, I, I, I think what I found it very interesting is that um, I think higher ed needs to think uh, more of a global perspective on this. I think um, uh, we need to have a global perspective in order to uh, not to not only like you know train our students, but also uh, in terms of um, uh, engaging a collaborative at you know a collaborative process on how we produce knowledge. Um, on how we address uh, issues of pandemics. Um, <clears throat> I mean, obviously this is a pandemic. It's like, I mean, vaccine nationalism, like nationalism and many of those things that we hear are, are, are things that don't really go with the spirit of collaboration, but also from a practical aspect, you know, like, you know, pandemics don't care. They don't have nationalities or borders. They, they usually go in, you know, do their stuff, which is spread like, you know, a wildfire. So I, I think, you know, it, higher education taking up on this, this global perspective to address uh, issues of inequality, uh, both in terms of access to vaccine, uh, but also in terms of collaborating with other um, uh, scientists and, and nation, nations uh, on good practices and best practices would be uh, a good way to go because right now um, I was just reading yesterday about WHO uh, report. It says that poor countries uh, have received just 0.2 percent of the total world vaccine supply, um, and it's not it's not it's not a good thing because um, when they get sicker, we will get sicker at some point because you know we're not we're not having a global perspective in terms of addressing. Uh, the the um, the the, uh, the pandemic. Great, I really want to leave time for this last question. So before we get to the uh, questions from the general audience, uh, this last question that I think really frames a great deal and really uh, represents many of the aspects that we have talked about today is how um, how in fact in fact can higher education. Uh, help transform uh, public health so that we can be a more resilient society. So, uh, Dr. Aminette, we uh, left off with you last time. So, um, if you would like, uh, or anyone else would like to kick that uh, that particular question off, that would be wonderful. Absolutely. Uh, I, you know, I think one of the things that we've learned from uh, the pandemic is that the university really needs to become an outreach of the community. Right, uh, uh, many, in many places, the university is like a silo, right? I mean, there's a, a, a city around the university and then there's the university and it's kind of like this different entity. 
Um, I, I think that we need to think of ourselves as an extension of the community that we live in, and we need to look at how we can utilize our resources to help uh, our community be more healthy, more resilient. As you know, as I talked about earlier, honored to, to lead an institute that that is a community outreach institute. That that our job is just that. It's to welcome the community in uh, people who have chronic diseases and disabilities. And, and utilize the physical and, and, you know, the human resources of the university to try to make an impact on their health. Um, if you look at, at COVID-19 and you look at the people who had kind of the worst um, outcomes uh, when, when they were infected, it was people with metabolic diseases, uh, people with cardiovascular diseases, and, and kind of pre-existing conditions. And so, as we look at kind of going forward, um, what I believe that we can do to help create a more resilient community is to create a community that has better cardiometabolic health, a community that has uh, more bus muscle and stronger bones and, and uh, is more functional because we know that the more physically and the more mentally strong that we are going into whatever lies ahead of us, uh, the more likely we are to to overcome and, and thrive through that. And, and I would make one last comment in this. And it, it's kind of uh, one of the things that I would say that I, I am incredibly proud about this university for doing uh, are the physical spaces on campus, the outdoor spaces that have been created here at the University of Houston Clear Lake um, for physical activity and exercise. You know, the intricate trails and sidewalks that have been added in partnership with Harris County. And I know there's an expansion uh, so when we are in a situation where we can't go indoors and exercise, uh, we've created a space where our community can come to this campus and, and remain physically active. And I, I believe that will help our resiliency as much as anything going forward. Wonderful. Who, who would like to comment upon that next? Uh, yes, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> You go, go ahead, Dr. Bishop. Oh, me? Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. That was a, that was a Zoom collision. Okay. Uh, so I, yes, I absolutely agree. I absolutely agree of what was just said, but if, if, if I could add to it though, um, I, I think, I think, uh, I, I just hope we don't forget that how quickly and effectively we pivoted. Um, we, we all, and you know, we as a university and we as a country, um, because it's, it's, it's not just higher education, it is, it is also people in the workplace. Um, people in the workplace had to pivot from, uh, you know, having all meetings face-to-face, -face, having large conferences all face-to-face, -face, um, you know, and me as a healthcare finance guy, you know, paying, paying a yearly lease on a property that you're not going to use anymore. <laughs> so I just hope we don't forget how quickly we pivoted and we pivoted to what? Our plan B. Um, you, you could say that this plan B is not as good as face, good as face to face. Uh, but, you know, it, it, and that's why it's called a plan B. <laughs> so, you know, just, just, I think that and having that in place before something major happens, because yes, COVID-19 is a big deal, but we're in Houston. We get hurricanes a lot, um, you know, and uh, uh, two months ago, we were in the Arctic too. So just, you know, having that plan B always in your pocket, ready to roll uh, would, would, yes, of course it would benefit the faculty and staff in terms of um, uh, in, in terms of maintaining a quasi status quo, but it would also give the students quick answers too. Like, um, where where do I have to show up to? And here's here's your Plan B answer. That's that's all I want to say. Thank you. Wonderful, uh, Dr. Alexander. I believe uh, you were on part of that uh, Zoom collision. So let's. That's that's okay. Um, and Dr. Mitchell, I'm glad that you did go first because now I can answer to two points of Dr. Mitchell and Dr. Eminet. And I just wanted to say all of those points were great. Not, uh, it's really quick. All I wanted to say was that I am proud to be part of a university that has such a multidisciplinary and interprofessional uh, 
um, faculty and, and programs, it would be wonderful when we talk about the community aspect and how to make ourselves more useful to that community is doing just what we're doing today, just bringing more programs, more community offerings, dedicating that time and talent to gift others is priceless. That's that's what I say. And we have a gold mine of experts. We have a gold mine of that information, both on our main campus as well as Pearland. And we need to utilize that more. And that's how we can reach the community. That's how we can connect. That's how we can network. Let me let me just add to that, uh, Dr. Alexander. As we as we round up, I wanted to be more specific and you know something more recent in with regards to how higher ed had, can help in the community. I would say that, for example, uh, my Houston Methodist has has had data showing that they've been one of the healthcare organizations that's been vaccinating people at the highest rate. You know, they just get people in there and out. And they even they came to us, to our department to say, look, can your students help us? We need all the volunteers that we can get. And we were just happy because my students are always looking for opportunities to volunteer or even, to, you know, intern and just send them out there to be the, like, if you've ever been in one of those huge centers of Houston Methodist, how they're moving the people. And for the students, it's another way of them to really see how they're contributing to helping us all get to this herd. That's where we all want to be, to get to herd immunity so we can start, you know, moving around as we can. So I think thinking about that in our classrooms and how we can help the community in terms of vaccine acceptance, in terms of uh, just even helping in terms of distribution, distributing vaccines or, or what whatnot is some of the things that our university higher ed can do to, to help with regards to that. Absolutely. Please. Do you mind if I piggyback back off of that? Oh, I, I really love how this conversation is just naturally uh, flowing. Uh, Dr. Ayandi makes uh, great points about, and Dr. Eminet and my other co-panelists about the role of the institution, the role of the university in serving the community. Um, Dr. Wolgu talked about um, how cultural competence and collaboration is very important in vaccine acceptance um, to combat vaccine hesitancy. Um, and one of the most effective ways to do that is um, targeted information in a patient's preferred language at their preferred location, whether that be places of worship, community centers. And so one of the the gems that universities can draw upon is our very diverse um, uh, regional, local, but also our international students to really do this reach out. Um, Houston is the, you know, the most diverse city. We have so many languages um, spoken here. One of the most effective ways to reach people is to talk to them in their preferred language. Um, and as we've seen with the census and now with vaccine hesitancy, I saw a video um, ye uh, yesterday, I believe, of somebody speaking in Farsi, um, my, my mother's native tongue, to encourage Iranians and Afghans to get vaccinated. And it would be one thing to speak to them in English, but to really draw upon cultural competency and cultural safety um, and recognized people in the community to encourage people to get vaccinated. And our university and, and universities around the country are so diverse and rich with knowledge and diversity that we can really do this type of reach, reach out, outreach that Dr. Ayadi was talking about. So I think that that is in addition to education and the science and all of those very important things, it's really doing a needs assessment of what our communities need and filling that gap. Wonderful. Great, can I, can I, can I <laughs> add a little bit? Okay, thank you, yeah. Um, I, I think this is great, yeah. So the other thing that higher ed can do is that I don't, I don't think we have talked about stigma here because I think this is also a very important topic that has been associated with this, with this illness, especially Asian Americans or people of Asian background has been, um, you know, uh, 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 you know, been stigmatized <clears throat> because of, you know, a lot of people wrongly associate this disease with, 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 uh, Asian Americans or uh, people of Asian background. So I think higher ed has a, has, um, a role here to play 
to uh, to talk about you know you know the uh, against this stigmatization and and um, um, uh, making people aware that this you know this that you know uh, that this is not something that uh, is the case. Uh, so uh, how ed could play a big role in terms of you know um, uh, bringing people of different backgrounds, that diverse background, to talk about issues that just comes with you know uh, pandemics like this. So I think stigma is one of them, and I think you know talking about it and addressing about it. Uh, and and uh, providing a scientific perspective to the issue rather than a stereotypical uh, mindset would be something very important. Wonderful. Let me ask one kind of concluding question here of the panel. Maybe one or two of you can respond to this before we move on to some of the questions coming from the, the uh, general audience. I was um, fascinated by uh, Dr. Hotez's notion of bringing scientists and political scientists together uh, to think about how we really address these issues. And so my question to you as a panel, um, how do you how you envision that occurring from a from a higher education point of view? What can we in higher education do to bring political scientists and indeed uh, scientists of all other types that address these big issues together in a way that would have an impact on on what faces us? Is, does anyone have a thought about that right off the uh, right off the top? I think maybe we could think about doing focus discussions at uh, our university. And I think that would address a lot of the issues that we talked about that come from some of the political uh, backlash, some of the political rhetoric, and some of the politics through science itself. And I thought about that when Dr. Wadu spoke about the stigmatism, we also have to realize that a lot of reasons why we're having so much pushback from this vaccine, and Dr. Holtes talked about that in the black and brown race, come from the historical data that comes all the way back from experiments like Tuskegee experiment. And um, the willingness to want to even have medical care or seek medical care in the first place, I think a lot of that is political because if you remember, that came from, that was a government research project that was done. So in essence to that question, I think focus groups that we would bring together of layman people, of experts, of scientists who are political, those who are not, and just trying to talk through, recognize and address those issues. I think that's how higher education can act. Wonderful. Uh, any other ideas with respect to that? This seems to be a really a, a great and focal point for us to discuss. Anyone else have some thoughts, please? Sure, I can, I can uh, briefly respond. Um, as I've mentioned before, uh, public health is at its core interdisciplinary. We, we cannot design public health interventions or programs in a silo, um, just thinking about improving health. We need to have economists, we need to have um, sociologists and anthropologists, historians, uh, communication specialists, and on and on. Because if we design the perfect program, if we're not understanding the community, the financial implications, uh, the social implications, the policy implications, it will just sit there and it will never be, um, it will never work. So um, public health as a field, when you look at um, centers of public health, when you look at public health schools, they, they all have interdisciplinary multi-specialty faculty um, and people from all backgrounds, agriculture, and on and on. And so I think um, the university is the perfect place to, as Dr. Alexander said, or kind of what we're doing today is having these discussions from various backgrounds to bring people with um, very specific areas of expertise and understand our commonalities to work so towards solutions in this field. Great. Maybe one other person, if you have something you really want to express about this really critical um, focal point. If I may, um, I think I think this like to your question directly, like how scientists and political scientists should talk about this. I think for me, the center would be policy, um, like you know, you know, um, bringing that conversation into policy is something that I think we have to, to talk about because uh, it has to have a root implication, like uh, Dr. Kessler talking about. Uh, uh, at the end of the day, we have to have that. Um, a multidisciplinary perspective, but having that conversation could um, 
be easily, uh, uh, you know, uh, have a policy implication. So the policy implication side is something that will come out of that discussion or that uh, that um, that synergy. Wonderful. I think in the time we have remaining, uh, perhaps we should take a few questions from uh, the, the uh, larger audience. Uh, some of these relate both to uh, Dr. Hotez, I will try to pick those that are more specific uh, to us as a panel. Uh, one that kind of overlaps uh, reads, uh, how can we get the African-American community to change their attitudes and perceptions about vaccination? And I know that Dr. Hotez articulated a few uh, exemplars around that, but I was wondering if anyone on the panel uh, this morning might have some additions or can build on uh, some of Dr. Hotez's ideas. So please. Kevin, Kevin, I would like to, because I've been focusing on that and I did bring that up. I think it's not only education, but I think it's also um, being in the trenches, as I would say, with them. So as an example, um, my church is giving the Johnson & Johnson vaccine along with Harris County um, on Saturday. But we didn't just say, okay, come get your vaccine. We kind of gave a backdrop and some education to we understand where you sit. We understand this whole, because that sits in people's mind, the whole Tuskegee experiment. I teach that to my students. I try to explain to nurses why there is a reluctance in the healthcare, that you're not going to be an experiment and how this is going to help you and not hinder you. And I think when you start coming to their level and you let them know, I let them know, yes, I am a nurse. I am a nurse with a PhD. However, I am also a black woman who understands how you feel. So I think that we have to meet them where they are understand why they feel that way and kind of really walk them through it. I'm going to be with you with this. I'm, you know, I took this injection myself. I think we have to go more to the churches, the, the communities, the not only the lower um, income communities, but the higher income communities too, because I have friends and colleagues who, you know, have college degrees and, and well established professions who feel they don't want to take the injection. So I think talking to them, mentoring them, educating them and following through with them. Hey, have you gotten your shot? They're giving it here. Do you need a ride? That type of thing. Great. Any uh, additional comments? Was, Dr. Ayati. I was also going to say to, to piggy up on what Dr. Alexander is saying is that we all have to model it as well. I mean, everybody in the African-American community is a sphere of influence it's an everybody i believe that everybody's an influenza in their own little sphere so for example i was teaching my graduate class when my text came from houston methodist um to come and come for my fox vaccine and i intentionally made sure to tell my students i'm like oh my god look my you know we were, my 40 students were on zoom i'm like my text came i'm so excited and that was deliberate because i'm I don't know. I know most of my students are highly motivated, but I don't know who that one person I might influence to go get their vaccine just because I made a big deal out of it. I made a big deal out of, you know, posting it on social media uh, deliberately because I am trying to model that I'm taking the vaccine and, as, and, and you just never know that one more person who your actions or your choices might influence to get the vaccine. So I think that everybody in our communities who wants to influence somebody who looks like them and who gets the vaccine needs to be modeling that as well. And I right. tell my friends, I'm not sick, you know, you, you, sh you share your effects from taking vaccines. Indeed, indeed. Um, here's a, a question I find uh, very compelling and it reads with regard to the scientific communica uh, communication being taught in the undergraduate uh, STEM ranks. Um, how could UH Clear Lake, or for that matter, other universities, um, integrate this into the curriculum for scientists? So this is more of a pedagogical question in many respects. I'm, I'm wondering if anyone on the panel might have some thoughts about that. Sure, I, I can speak to that. Um, I briefly touched upon it earlier, um, but really integrating the translation, and by by this I don't mean language to language translation, but really different types of um, Met, um, methods of communication, um, the translation, and then the dissemination of scientific information. 
um, to different parties, different learners at different levels, different communities. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we are in the age of quick information, quick communication. So whether that is taking you know, a 25 page scientific paper and condensing it to 140 character tweet, um, it, it, it is very, you know, it makes me laugh, but one of, the, one of the most effective ways that we are seeing now is scientists actually getting on Twitter. Dr. Hotez himself is very active on Twitter um, and really disseminating information and reaching populations um, that might otherwise not have access to this information, um, whether that be in a different language, whether that be through video, um, or community outreach, but really knowing how to say things and where exactly to put that, whether that's in the Houston Chronicle or other newspapers, um, on Facebook. Uh, and the question is, how do you integrate that? Really, you can do that every week in class, right? If we are reading this paper, part of the uh, assignment is to not only write me a very nice literature review or um, you know, summary of the article or an article critique, but to tell me really, how, how would you say this to your uncle at Thanksgiving dinner? Um, if he fires back with some counter arguments, how would you hold a discussion? And we actually do that um, in our graduate classes. We really take hot topics. Um, our students pre uh, you know, present information on both sides or multiple sides of the argument to really hone their discussion and debate skills because that is, that's what you do in the real world. You, you talk with people who have different viewpoints. Um, and so um, being able to communicate in multiple modalities is very important um, as the person who asked the question highlighted um, and as Dr. Hotez um, indicated today. Wonderful. Maybe time for one more response to this question. This seems to be a, a really uh, enlightening question. Uh, anybody have a compelling uh, argument or thought uh, with respect to this? Can I follow up to that just a little bit? Um, I appreciate what uh, Dr. Custer said. And I, I would expand upon that and say that it's not just uh, students who need to be trained how to use Twitter and Facebook and all these things to communicate science with the public, but it's it's other scientists, right? I mean, we, we live in silos, as uh, Dr. Hotez said. I mean, we're, we're taught to be very specialized, to write papers that other scientists within our discipline read, and maybe even people outside of the discipline can't even understand it. So um, I, I know Dr. Custer's uh, about a year and a half ago sat me down in front of a computer and said, Bill, this is Twitter. Uh, let me show you how to use it. And I still haven't figured it out yet. Um, but, but, but that point is, is really to all of us, is that we need to learn um, you know, and, and as Dr. Hotez said, right, there's never any credit going to be given for writing tweets on your annual report or, um, you know, communicating on uh, whatever news media that you may be on. But, but I really believe that that's our obligation as a scientist, and we need to understand that our impact, um, it, it may be so much more profound in communicating in those mediums uh, than it is necessarily in, in writing a paper that's in a peer-reviewed journal, though that, of course, that still needs to, to be forefront. Okay, great. Well, Thank you. One more it, brief comment, and then we're going to need to <laughs> close out today. I was just going to say that if you can't put the tweet as a, as a, under your research, you can put it under service, <laughs> service activities. <laughs> okay. Well, we're getting very close to our uh, closure point today. I do want to thank um, our featured speaker, Dr. Hotez. Uh, I think his presentation was simply marvelous and very motivational to all of us that have concern about this. And, I, and again, I want to, to thank all of the panelists uh, and, uh, and my wonderful co-host, Dr. Adadi. So uh, one quick thing before we sign off, uh, and I don't know if we can bring up the slide, but I do want to mention that on the 23rd, uh, I see it coming up right now. On the 23rd, we will have another uh, and the final um, session uh, of the Presidential Speaker Series for this spring. Um, and it involves mental health and COVID, uh, uh, how higher education can help. The, the mental health aspect came up numerous times uh, during the day. So I know that this is something that will um, have a lot of energy about it. So on the, uh, on the 23rd, uh, we will uh, host uh, Dr. Joshua Gordon, and Dr. Gordon is, in fact, the, um, 
the director for the National Institute of Mental Health. So we, in addition to Dr. Hotez, um, uh, a corollary in terms of uh, mental health expertise, we will find uh, in terms of Dr. Gordon. So please, uh, if you found today um, interesting and compelling, um, and hopefully um, like myself, you found something quite useful and you feel a bit more educated and a bit more empowered to deal with those things that face us, please do join us uh, using the same link that you used to find us today. Uh, uh, please do join us on the 23rd. So on behalf of all of those that made this program possible, we thank you for joining us and we do hope to see you again on the 23rd. On that note, I will simply say, uh, have a wonderful day and thank you so much for joining us. Take care, bye-bye. Thank you.